spin your passion into a business with Shopify and break sales records with the world's best converting checkout. Let's hear that one more time. The world's best converting checkout. Shopify's legendary checkout makes it easier for customers to shop on your website, across social media, and everywhere in between. Now that's music to your ears. Any way you spin it, you can be a smash hit with Shopify. Start your dollar a month trial today at shopify.com slash records. Nothing affects families like serious illness. Life as we know it stops when a loved one gets cancer, Alzheimer's disease, or sickle cell anemia. As we start this Commando On Demand podcast, I want to tell you about a heart patient. His name is Wayne. He went to the Regeneration Center of Thailand for what's called Enhanced Cardiac Cell Replacement Therapy. I'll tell you more about that later in this podcast, but let's talk a little bit more about Wayne first. Wayne was 64 years old. He was a smoker. Wayne survived two massive heart attacks, both resulting in angioplasty. He was on nine different medications. Okay, but one year after his stem cell regenerative transplant, he has had zero incidents of chest pain, no visits to the emergency room. He reduced two medications that he was taken, and he actually eliminated four altogether. But check this out. By the end of the century, Life as we know it now is going to be dramatically different because experts are sure that diseases will be either eliminated or just a bother, something like the common cold. Impossible, you say? Maybe. But medicine and technology are coming together in unprecedented ways and big things are happening. Amazing things that no one even thought was possible, say, five years ago. Now, the most powerful movers and shakers on the planet are betting billions of dollars on brand new breakthroughs that promise to defeat disease by the end of the century, if not before. So in this podcast, I'm going to lead you through this giant top secret lab. And imagine this, we're going to open each and every door and find out exactly what the buzz is all about. You're going to hear how the greatest minds in medicine and technology, they're zeroing in on one specific purpose to significantly reduce or eliminate disease-caused suffering by the end of the century, or maybe even sooner. You won't believe the gains that they're making in the cures for cancer, sickle cell anemia, heart disease, and others. So you definitely want to stick around. There is incredible hope on the horizon. I'm Kim Commando, and in these Commando On Demand podcasts, this is what I love about them. I get to delve into one particular topic, and that's something I just can't do because of the time limitations on my weekend radio show. Which, if you are listening to this podcast, I have to tell you right up front, because people are confused. The Commando On Demand podcasts, they are not the Kim Commando Show podcasts. If you'd like to get the Kim Commando Show podcast, head over to getkim.com. Once again, you want to sign up over at getkim.com. You have to check blind spots to drive safely, right? Same thing goes for identity theft protection. If you just monitor your credit, you might miss something. Like your info for sale on the dark web. LifeLock detects a wider range of identity threats to help protect your identity. No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses, but LifeLock offers visibility you might not get on your own. Membership starts at $9.99 a month, plus applicable taxes. Go to LifeLock.com. Use promo code KIM to save 10%. Okay, so this is it. The Lobby. We're in our fictitious lab where technology is helping great innovators fight all the diseases that ruin families. We just hate them. Let's take a tour. Here's our first stop, the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation. You've heard of Mark Zuckerberg, of course. He's the founder of Facebook. Whether you agree with his politics or not, he and his wife Priscilla Chan They've publicly spoken that they want a disease-free world in their lifetimes. They've committed $3 billion over the next 10 years to get it done. Let's see if Mark and Priscilla will actually talk to us. Authorization required. Access granted. Hey, Mark, we're not Facebook friends, but thanks for joining us. The Chan Zuckerberg Foundation has said that they want to get rid of any type of diseases in your children's lifetimes. Doesn't that seem kind of far-fetched? Then it actually doesn't seem that far-fetched that uh, by the end of the century, which is you know, 84 years from now, so we have a long period of time, that, that we can have really made progress 
getting to a point where we've either been able to cure diseases, eliminate them, or just be able to manage them as, as kind of non-harmful ongoing conditions, you know, like a cold or something like that. Of course, you started out in technology. Everybody knows that. You put together Facebook. But what made you want to tackle disease? And how did you put all these pieces together? So we, we started this big initiative. We hired a world-renowned uh, neuroscientist and geneticist, uh, Dr. Corey Bargman. And the strategy is to build tools that will help scientists all over the world to uh, make faster progress on, on curing diseases. And uh, again, I mean, there's no way that we're going to do this by ourselves, right? So I mean, the, the whole scientific establishment around the world and all these people doing research, that's so much more than anything that we can do. But the thing that we can do is bring our engineering skills to be able to build tools to make it so that all the scientists all around the world can make faster progress than they would have otherwise. And we think that if we can do that, we can accelerate this and play a small part in, in helping the world to cure all these diseases by the, the end of the century. Not everyone can just jump on board this thing. Priscilla, in your vision for the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation, what type of people are you looking for? Who do you really want to collaborate with? We want people who are uh, both experts in thinking about the theory behind the field, but we also want people who are really deep in the practice. Um, I, I still work as an educator and as a pediatrician every day, and that really influences the way we think about the problem. And so we are looking for people with both of those perspectives. I've often told my son Ian this. Every generation has the responsibility to do more than the previous generation. Well, as I've been researching this, it's obvious technology and medicine are getting close to not only outsmarting diseases, but also regenerating damaged organs and tissues. You know, one of my favorite sayings in the technology industry is people overestimate what you can do in a couple of years, but underestimate what you can do in 10 years. And I really think that that's true. You know, a lot of people, I think, focus a lot of energy on just to like today's problems and the short term work. But I actually think the biggest opportunities to make a change are to look at whole systems like the education system or the health system or, or how science is done and to think about how if you work on that consistently over a 10 or 15 or 20 year period, um, how you can make more progress or how you can give more students personalized learning, how you can give more scientists the, the funding and tools they need to make a bigger impact. You know, whether you're, you're funding things at a big scale or building tools that, that some teachers can use or some scientists can use, that's something that I think everyone can, can play a role in and, and can help out with. Anything else you want to add? Thank you for all of your support. It means a lot to us. It would not be possible for us to try to do all this work and help people. So thank you to, to everyone out there who's uh, joining us in, in this mission to advance human potential and to promote equal opportunity. And um, we'll, we'll see you guys soon. Okay, here's the next stop. Are you ready for it? It's a huge project by the name of Grail. They're all about early detection of cancer using just a little bit of blood. Getting the blood is simple, but the computation is really intense. Every individual reads over a terabyte of data, but it's totally worth it. Early detection is the key to treating cancer, and Grail hopes to detect it earlier than anyone ever thought was possible. Grail's chief officer is Jeff Huber, one of the leading engineering managers from Google. Everyone who Googles has used at least one of his applications, which actually makes him the perfect choice to head up Grail. Investors already have this tremendous confidence in them. Get this, to the tune of $100 million and over $1 billion in venture funding. Let's see if he's in right now. Authorization required. Access granted. Jeff, thanks for buzzing me in. And I just have to know, what inspired you to make this incredible leap from engineering applications like Google Maps to conquering and getting into human and disease science? As I was looking across the set of opportunities and looking broadly across uh, the technology landscape and, and science landscape, the thing that really resonated for me was the phase shift that was happening in life sciences. Uh, specifically enabled by new technologies like next generation sequencing, where you're effectively able to digitize biology. And I've always looked at, at innovation uh, as coming at intersections. I was coming from a background in computer science, and it felt like with this new direction or this phase shift in life science, 
that that was a really interesting opportunity to, to drive, um, to, to visit that intersection, to learn at that intersection, and to be able to bring the, the power and tools and technology that I was familiar with from building you know, very large scale uh, billion user applications at Google and computer science uh, to this wave of data that was going to be coming uh, in life sciences uh, with next generation sequencing. I've read all the research, but what is GRAIL's ultimate mission? The GRAIL's mission is to detect cancer early when it can be cured. The underlying premise of that is very simple. Cancer that's discovered at an early stage, stage one or stage two, it depends a little bit on cancer type, but the outcomes are overwhelmingly positive. 70%, 80%, 90% rates of cure. The cure today is simple. You cut it out before it spreads and becomes more complex. Cancer that's discovered at late stage in contrast, stage three, stage four, is, is roughly the inverse. 80 to 90 percent negative where people die. So at simplest, we're trying to make that shift instead of detecting at late stage where the odds are stacked against you. We want to shift it to early stage where the odds are with you. I have to tell you, anybody who listens to these Commando On Demand podcasts, uh, they're gearheads. They love technology. Can you explain some of the tech behind your mission? The underlying technology behind that is uh, what we call ultra intense genome sequencing where we're sequencing an order of magnitude broader, two or three orders of magnitude deeper than anyone else is, generating on the order of a terabyte of data for every test that we do. Um, that data is then fed into uh, leading technology, machine learning, deep learning systems that can ultimately make that diagnosis at its earliest stages. And the entire medical field is cheering you on because you're starting to do just that. But in the beginning, Grail's technique was discovered kind of by accident, wasn't it? Uh, the background or genesis of it was they had acquired a company called Veronata that was working on non-invasive prenatal testing, which was a blood test that took a, a blood draw from uh, a pregnant mother and was able to detect uh, fragmentary DNA in the mother's blood that was a signal of fetal abnormalities, things like Down syndrome. Uh, after they had done 100,000 of those tests, they had about 20 tests that were anomalous where they couldn't explain the result. And what they found from that uh, when they dug in was that those were cases of actually very late stage cancer that hadn't yet been diagnosed. That little light bulb at Illumina that said, okay, with this test that was developed for a completely different purpose, clearly there is signal there. And we were able to detect it at, if you imagine cancer kind of by stage increasing in complexity and in concentration in the blood uh, of the fragmentary DNA and RNA that is there. Um, they were able to detect it at very late stage and high concentration. What would it take to slide down that curve to the very earliest stages? But it's really a whole nother level of, of this is a moral and ethical imperative given the potential for, for impact. You said before that there's a personal story behind your mission. Um, my wife, Laura, uh, who is 46 years old, healthy, fit, no family history of cancer whatsoever, uh, started having some, some symptoms. And that led to a two-month diagnostic quest that ultimately resulted in uh, a diagnosis of, of late-stage cancer, colon cancer specifically. That obviously was a, was a shock um, for her, for me, with no symptoms to then be diagnosed with colon cancer that had uh, spread extensively to her liver through her lymph system. That began 18 months of treatment. Um, I'm confident that she got the best treatment in the world. Um, but... While it was a noble battle, it was ultimately a losing fight because of where it started. I'm very confident that if Grail had existed three or four years earlier, that uh, Laura could have, had a, could have had a very different outcome. Um, you know, she could be alive today instead of, instead of where we are. And now, with your experience at Google and the pain of losing Laura as a motivator to help others, Grail just seems to be growing nonstop. We've grown from 40 people in March to uh, almost 150 today, and there's been a rocket ship ride ever since. Okay, so behind this door, there's some real genius going on. It belongs to Jennifer Doudna and one of her research contemporaries, Mark DeWitt. Jennifer and her colleague, Emmanuel Charpentier, have amazed the clinical and research world by discovering a way to literally edit out disease genes. That's right, I said that, edit out the genes that cause these diseases. So if you have this hereditary disease in your family, you really want to listen up. Jennifer is a biochemist at UC Berkeley. Her colleague, Manuel, is the director of the Max Planck Institute of Infection Biology in Berlin. 
Together, they've created an easy and cheap way to make precise changes in DNA in order to disable some genes and correct genetic disorders. The project name is called CRISPR-Case9, a hybrid of protein and RNA. That's the cousin to DNA that functions as sort of a search and snip system in bacteria. And if any of you use computers to edit audio, video, or text, you're probably familiar with the basics. At first, it became a way to recognize and kill viruses and say, the food we eat. But Jennifer Doudna soon realized that it could also work well in other cells, including human cells, to actually perform genetic editing. She's a hot item now, having been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. The National Academy of Sciences recently awarded the Breakthrough Prize and the Life Sciences Award. Let's just see if she's in. Authorization required. Access granted. Jennifer, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about CRISPR-9. Really quick, if you can do that, explain the discovery that led to the basis of your work. It turns out that a lot of bacteria have in their chromosome a sequence of repeats that are interspaced with sequences that are derived from viruses. But nobody knew what the function of these sequences might be until it was noticed that they tend to also occur with a series of genes that are um, often encode proteins that have homology to enzymes that do interesting things like DNA repair. So it was a hypothesis that this system, which came to be called CRISPR, could actually be an acquired immune system in bacteria that might allow sequences to be integrated from viruses and then somehow used later to protect the cell from an infection with that same virus. So I mentioned to my Tech Hungry listeners that genetic editing is a little like audio editing or word processing. So we're all just trying to know how. Once you discovered the genes, you began to actually cut and paste those genes around. So what emerged over the next several years was that, in fact, these CRISPR systems really are acquired immune systems in bacteria. So until this point, no one knew that bacteria could actually have a way to adapt to viruses that get into the cell. But this is a way that they do it. And it involves detecting foreign DNA that gets injected from a virus that gets into the cell. The CRISPR system allows Uh, integration of short pieces of those viral DNA molecules into the CRISPR locus. And then in the second step, these CRISPR sequences are actually uh, transcribed in the cell into pieces of RNA that are subsequently used together with proteins encoded by the Cas genes, these CRISPR-associated genes, to form interfering or interference complexes that can use the information in the form of these RNA molecules to base pair with matching sequences in viral DNA. So a very nifty way that bacteria have come up with to take their invaders and turn the sequence information against them. And Mark, how long does the fix last? I mean, are the genes you edited today going to maintain those cells to help keep a person healthy years from now? So to test that, we edited human cells in the laboratory. We then injected them into mice. And then we looked at the editing of the cells four months later and asked whether or not the edited cells hung around. When we do that, we find that about 2% of the stem cells that remain in the bone marrow um, after four months are edited which in the case of sickle cell disease, that that level of editing is likely to have a clinical benefit, but we would like to get a little bit better than 2% um, in the future. I know a lot of people are absolutely stoked about this because there's already been proven progress in helping people with sickle cell disease. Um, Any comment on that? As for the excitement about the future of this technique, I'm extremely excited because... You know, we haven't been trying this for very long. You know, we will get better. And what we have right now is already, you know, if we can scale it up and make sure that it works well, is already good enough to form the basis of a clinical trial to cure sickle cell disease. So, Jennifer, what other applications does this new technology enter into? So, of course, uh, lots of lots of basic biology that can be done now with the uh, engineering of model organisms 
and different kinds of cell lines that are cultured in the laboratory to study the behavior of cells, um, but also in biotechnology, being able to make uh, targeted changes in plants and various kinds of fungi that could be very useful for different sorts of industrial applications. And, and then, of course, in biomedicine, with lots of interest in the potential to use this technology as a tool for um, you know, really uh, coming up with novel therapies for human disease, I think is something that's very exciting and is really a, a something that's on the horizon already. All sorts of applications that we, many of which we couldn't have even imagined uh, even two years ago. Coming up is a topic that's near and dear to me. After all, my father died of a heart attack. We're going to explore some of the latest tech breakthroughs for people with heart conditions from a world-class expert. It's just astounding. Life happens. With ADT, you can feel safe with an ADT starter kit professionally installed for only $49. Call today and install an ADT starter kit that includes security panel, keypad, key fob, entry and motion sensors, and for a limited time, get a camera included and installed at no additional cost. That's a $449 value installed for just $49. Requires 36 month monitoring contrast QSB and easy pay activation early turn fees may apply. Certain marks excluded. License available at ADT.com. Florida EF001121. You can see f Can you hear that? We must be in the cardiology wing. Heart disease is still a number one killer. And I bet you're wondering who's working big time on that. Well, don't even try to mention cardiology without referring to Dr. Nabil Deep. Dr. Deep is the founder and president of the International Society for Cardiovascular Translational Research, or they shorten it up to ISCTR. Anything to do with your heart, he's the guy. He's a professor of medicine at the University of Arizona Medical College and director of the Clinical Cardiovascular Cell Therapy at the University of California. So I called him up. And I have to tell you, the latest tech breakthrough for people with heart conditions is just astounding. He said he'd be willing to chat again on our tour today. So here it goes. Authorization required. Access granted. Doctor, I'd love for you to share with my listeners what you said on the phone. How many people did you say die from heart failure each year? Still approximately 500,000 patients die from heart failure per year. So clearly we need a new therapy that can change this path. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought I heard you say that in other countries, alternative cutting-edge treatments are available, but we seem to have a roadblock here in the United States. Uh, as you know, in the United States, the only treatment available for end-stage heart failure is heart transplant, and we have only available about 3,000 donors per year. And what we need is 500,000 patients. So clearly some therapy need to take a place to change the course of this disease. So you've been given the green light to develop a brand new method to treat heart patients using stem cells. And the method of delivery kind of piggybacks on the past success of stem cell research here in the United States actually has been tremendous advancement in the stem cell over the last 13 years. The first stem cell in the United States started in the year 2000. And now over the last 13 years, uh, we have seen tremendous development in terms of isolating the stem cell, in terms of expand them, and the transplant them, the method of delivery. And those tremendous advancements will play significant role in the way that we are going to treat uh, cardiovascular disease in medicine. But what kind of patients do you treat? The term heart disease, it covers a lot of ground. Uh, Clearly, depending on the clinical indication, we divide uh, the clinical indication to patients who have heart attack, heart failure, refractory chest pain, or a stroke. And we do have a stem cell line to apply on those patients or to treat those patients. And what kind of stem cells do you use? I know this is a sore spot for some folks. So the most common adult stem cell use taken from the bone marrow, and uh, we can apply them in two forms, whether we call it autologous, which is mean taking from the same body of the patient and apply to the same patient, or allogeneic, which is taking from one donor, and then we can expand those cells, and uh, one patient from one donor, we can obtain cell to treat 30,000 patients. And your hope is that stem cells will do more than just treat the symptoms. 
what we think is that the stem cell is going to be the treatment of the disease instead of treating symptoms, which is mean regeneration of a new heart muscle or regeneration of a new blood vessels to make the heart stronger or to build a new blood vessel to increase the blood supply to the heart. Dr. Deeb, are there any exciting technological developments for the heart that maybe aren't quite ready, but sort of waiting in the wings? In addition to the stem cell, currently we are uh, running a research in Mercy Gilbert in multi-center clinical trial in the U.S. A new stent that uh, can be placed in the artery for blockages, to treat a blockage, and the stent can be absorbed within two years and no need for long-term anticoagulation. So there's tremendous exciting technology coming in cardiovascular disease. And here's something you don't hear every day. You are actually accepting new patients. That's correct. Uh, So the patient, if he's eligible, whether he have heart failure, shortness of breath, despite of best medical therapy available, or recent heart attack, or continue to have chest pain, or a stroke that has been six months and continue to have uh, consequences of the stroke, disability, and so on. So if you want to register as a new patient or find out more about Dr. Deep's work, just visit isctr.com. Okay, this is where things start to get really interesting and maybe a little scary. I saw a video of a medical research visionary, Jared Tocher. It looked like he was quite literally controlling the movements of a living mouse with a light. Like I said, it was scary, but he's not some kind of mad scientist in a lab. He's actually the assistant professor of molecular biology at Princeton University. He believes that by using optogenetics to control cells, it will eventually help treat cancer patients, repair organs and tissues. Authorization required. Access granted. So, Jared, I noticed that you have a very different approach to your work than many of your peers. So as a biological engineer, I really view cells as programmable devices. Every cell in our body is a programmable device that we can use to carry out complex functions. Cells can be reprogrammed and undergo huge structural changes during life, and they can produce materials like spider silk that are even tougher than uh, Kevlar. Is your approach being utilized yet, or is it just in this experimental phase? So these sorts of approaches are actually really uh, relevant already in the clinic. So in this amazing new technique of T-cell immunotherapy, uh, it's possible to take cells out of a patient, introduce designer receptors that allow them to hunt down and track cancer cells and put them back into the patient, in some cases just melting tumors away. So in terms of actually programming a cell like a mini computer, how is that coming along? This is really challenging because cells are in some sense wet computers whose programming language we're only beginning to understand. Um, And instead of uh, transistors, the circuits in these cells are proteins that might wink on and off or move from one location to another or assemble in little uh, miniature machines and little uh, nanoclusters like oil and water. And moreover, even if we knew what program to deliver, the tools that we have in biology to actually program inputs are incredibly rudimentary. So using even the best drugs, we can't add a drug to one cell and not affect its neighbors to turn things on only in that cell at one time. And even with the amazing revolution of genome editing, we still are not able to um, uh, do anything other than make a permanent modification. So we can't control this when and where we want. Let's get back to that controlling a mouse with light thing. That was really impressive. For some of you, this might sound familiar. Light control in biology is what's called optogenetics, and it's really made amazing revolutions already in neuroscience. Using light-gated ion channels in the brain, we can actually control movements, memories, and many more things inside animals uh, and potentially even in people. But, of course, the power of optogenetics goes far beyond neuroscience. There are many more types of cells out there than neurons and many other processes than in the brain. And so my laboratory uses light-gated proteins to actually move, uh, to stick to each other or catalyze chemical reactions to be able to move proteins around around inside a cell, or even assemble miniature factories to synthesize natural products of interest. Well, I can't quite picture that. Can you unpack that for us and tell us more about it? So one example is that we might be able to take a protein that controls cell motility and cell movement, wire it to a light-sensitive module, and then every time we shine light on a cell, we can move it when and where we want, like a cat following a laser pointer. Jared, I just want to know what's brewing in your lab for the future. I mean, how far do you actually want to take this? One of the things my lab would really like to do in a long-term sense is the idea of being able to program and repair tissues and organs. 
For that, we actually look to nature and how this naturally happens during embryogenesis. In the embryo, there are proteins that actually act as uh, sort of zip code proteins or compass proteins that tell cells where they are and then therefore what to become. So one of our immediate goals was to actually be able to make light controlled versions of these zip code proteins so we could turn on different organizational programs when and where we want the embryo. Okay, what about cancer? Cancer is a disease in which the pathways that control cell growth become rewired so that a cell will grow in environments where it normally wouldn't. And we imagined that we might be able to diagnose this by actually probing the inputs to these growth pathways with light, measuring responses, and where treatment with appropriate chemotherapy drugs actually could turn the cancer cell signal processing back to that of a normal cell. And now we can envision all optical diagnosis where we might be able to probe entire functional processes in the cancer cell, even detecting mutations that we haven't yet identified in other methods to be able to identify which drug optimally takes. Of course, this is only the beginning of this very exciting new field. There are many other approaches we can imagine in the future. Right now, it's very exciting to think that we can go beyond light to other sorts of fields, like magnetic fields or ultrasound, to be able to address cells deep inside an organism. Wow, Jared, this is pretty heavy stuff. Molecular biology is definitely not my field, but I'm super glad it's yours. You're obviously very gifted at what you do, and I truly wish you all the best in helping the human immune system function so much better. Thank you very much. Okay, let's let all of this sink in. I'm sure the prospect of fixing human disease brings up some mixed emotions. But one thing's for sure, I'm impressed by the technology and also by the passion of the innovators. They truly want to end human suffering in terms of disease. But at what lengths are they willing to take their methods? So I just want to make three points quickly before we end this podcast. One is, of course, there are ethics involved. Jennifer Doudna from CRISPR doesn't feel that gene editing in embryos would be ethically correct because that editing would affect an entire genetic line. She recommends only editing genes in fully formed adults. Jared Tochner may have a different view. In this podcast, I'm asking you to think critically for yourself and talk about it with your friends and your family because the question may come up one day if you or your children have to make important medical decisions. The second point, you can take matters into your own hands. If you're afraid of disease and the suffering that it causes, you're not alone. So actually join the club, the health club that is. According to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, obesity-related illness, including chronic disease, disability, and death, will cost the United States $344 billion annually by next year. That's a lot of Twinkies. The World Health Organization reports that at least 80% of all heart disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes, and up to 40% of cancer could be prevented if we all ate better, engaged in more physical activity, and just quit using tobacco. Hereditary disease is one thing, but let's at least try to stay in the fight. Do what we can to end suffering in our own homes. Take care of your body. That's pretty low tech. You don't need a molecular biologist to do it for you. And finally, Eastern newts and newborn mice are able to regenerate their legs and even parts of their hearts. Researchers are trying to figure out how to harness that same gene for humans. You don't have to wait for that breakthrough. If you start taking care of yourself right now, see what your own body can do. Make 2018 the year that you really get into shape. If you have a smartphone or tablet, get the apps to help you out. Best of all, if you have a smart watch or even just a Fitbit, that'll help keep you motivated too. And don't forget about you time. Have a cup of tea, go for a walk, or just lay down and close your eyes for a couple of minutes. It can actually do wonders. Thanks for listening to this Commando On Demand podcast. If you like what you hear, be sure to share this information with your family members and friends. My podcasts are available on iTunes and in the Google Play Store, but the best way to listen is to get them in the free commando.com app. Just search for Commando and iTunes or Google Play. Oh, and by the way, would you like to watch my show live or maybe on demand on your schedule? You can if you're a Kim's Club member. Learn more at club.commando.com. And also, as a Kim's Club member, you can even come by and be my guest in the studio next time you're in Phoenix. And to listen to my show wherever you may be all across America, go to commando.com slash radio. Kim Commando is brought to you in part by HelloFresh. Delicious meals at home in under 30 minutes. Start today at HelloFresh.com slash Kim.
Come strengthen your pack at the new Great Wolf Lodge in Manteca. With over 50 attractions, we wanted to see how many we can name in the remaining seconds of this ad. River Canyon Run, Oliver's Moonstone Maze, Tin Paw Bowling, Howler's Peak Ropes Course, Magi Quest, Slaptail Pond Wave Pool, Build-A-Bear Workshop, Storytime, a four-story water Only fort, 40 Ruby more to go. And now that a getaway to Great Wolf Lodge in Manteca is just a short ride away, families have time to experience every attraction at the lodge. Great Wolf Lodge, strengthen the pack.